my Daphnia tank. So I set it up about mm, over nine months ago now. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that this is a good way to go. There's lots of different ways you can do Daphnia tanks. You don't have to have a glass tank like this. You could use any kind of a container, even five gallon buckets I've heard people using. But I think that could get difficult in the long run. I like this because I can see what's going on and the volume of water. This is a 55 gallon tank. You could definitely do smaller or bigger, but having at least that, you know, around 50, 55 gallons, I think will help in the long run for maintaining healthy water. Typically a little more water is easier to deal with than, than less water. It's super simple. All I did was fill the tank with water and make sure it was dechlorinated. And I, uh, I purchased just on the internet, I had shipped in a, a Daphnia culture and I put them in there. And I wanted to establish something that I wasn't going to have to spend a lot of time maintaining, you know, a lot of problems with it. I've included plants and sort of a filtration system that actually works pretty well. This is my own little invention here. I'll, I'll show you how I did that. But the, the idea is that it is actually a cycling tank. The, the nitrogen cycle is complete and, it, and it's, it's doing well. So you got to, in order to get a complete nitrogen cycle going, you have to have plants of some sort and a biological filter and the animals producing the waste for the ammonia, right? So besides the Daphne in here, there's all kinds of other stuff and some of it I have no idea what it is, but there's, there's snails in there and some, you know, like I say, I, I really don't know what all this stuff is, but it's pretty cool. If you look at this under a, under a magnifying glass, there's a lot going on in this tank besides the Daphne. How I built the filter, okay. Now you can see I've got a bubbler going there because aeration is important for Daphne. Um, but if you put in a regular pump and filter or a regular fish tank, well, that's a little tricky because the pump's gonna suck in the Daphne and, and that's not gonna work for you. You could put sponges over the intake, but still the Daphne get pushed into that. And, and the, I did try that at the beginning and it just didn't work out. So what I came up with, it's a, like a flower pot for aquatic plants a three gallon flower pot bag i guess i'm not sure exactly what you're supposed to call them so what i did was take a whole bunch of these little filter media ceramics and it just kind of looks like a bone but you know how bones have a lot of pores in them well this is a similar type of structure within this are millions and millions of little pores and, and just a ton of surface area places for bacteria to grow in fact, I pulled this one out of the tank. There, there's another one there since it's got loose when I was making it. But on this, there's, uh, you know, who knows how many, but millions and millions and millions of tiny little bacteria that does the nitrogen cycle for you. So that's what I filled it, put in the bag. Put this guy back in the water. Now the air pump, the point of that, besides aerating the water, is to get the water to flow through the bag and through all that media to feed the, the bacteria, basically, you can think about it that way. Now you can see that those bubbles are pretty big and it's working. It's been working like this for a long time. And you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But next time, whenever I do tear this apart and then maybe clean the filter or, or kind of get it going again, I'll put some air stones on the air lines there and get some finer bubbles. I think that'd be a better way to go, but it's working fine just like this too. But all it is is two air lines shoved down into the bottom of the bag. So it's forcing air to, to push that water up through all the filter media. And that works really well. And I get that idea from what would probably be the ideal way to go would be a, a sponge filter where you've got air like that, just pushing the water through the sponge and all the bacteria lives in the sponge. And that's a really great system that's used a lot for shrimp, for a small, like cherry shrimp. But this works too, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm real happy with it. The plants, I've got duckweed in there, which is a great filtering plant, grows like crazy. And also some water hyacinth, which is a great filtration type plant. And also a reason why I've got the water hyacinth in here is I'm trying to keep it alive over the winter, because hyacinth is from the Amazon originally, I believe. And, and the stuff, you know, if you leave it out during the winter here in the Northwest, it's going to die off. It might make it through the winter, but it, it starts looking pretty ugly. So I keep it in here. It's under the light. It's doing well in the spring. I can just put some back out in the pond and have some water hyacinth out in the pond. 
but they are amazing little things. They're also called water fleas. Maybe you had them when you were a kid. Maybe you did a, in schools, you know, used to do little projects with, with water fleas. Well, those are the daphnia. If you fish lakes like, I know Shasta Lake, Northern California is completely full of daphnia and, and lots of lakes are. And these are the magnets though, the big ones. And, and the way they reproduce, it's kind of interesting. They, they reproduce both sexually and asexually. So right now, these guys being kept like this, they're not going into their, their dormant stage, so to speak. I do have a little heater in there. I uh, keep the water right around 68 degrees, and that seems to be good. But I've had them down a lot colder, I've had them a lot warmer. They seem pretty happy with it all. And, and even with the colder water, it was getting down close to 40 degrees. They were still reproducing. As long as they have food, it seems like they'll reproduce. They're pretty much all females right now in this particular species in, in this stage. Each one of these guys can produce inside of them like a hundred eggs. And then those eggs hatch inside of them. So you can imagine how small these guys are. And then they release those rather quickly. And it's only a less than a week process. So it's amazing. So you can have one Daphnia, you can produce a hundred Daphnia, and those hundred Daphnia are each gonna produce a hundred Daphnia within less than a week. So this is a, a, you know, you talk about rabbits, boy, these guys got, got it going on for sure when it comes to reproduction. So food is incredibly important to these guys. No food, no Daphnia. You know, and like I said, they're down, from my experience here, they don't seem to be so sensitive to water and light and all that. I do have a light on a, on a timer here, but I've messed around with less light and more light and they seem to still reproduce as long as they've got food. So if you don't give them food, they're going to stop reproducing. And what would happen with this species, I've never, haven't tried it, but they'll, some of the, some of them will turn into males and they'll produce uh, eggs through sexual reproduction and they're, they're a different kind of egg they're, they're harder and they'll sink down to the bottom and they can survive through a cold winter or time with no food or if the pond dries up or whatever and then when the conditions are right again they get good water and good food they'll hatch and you've got Daphne so they're pretty uh, amazing when it comes to survival so what do you feed them well what I've got in this little Yeti cup here is ground up i say ground up i've got a food processor a single like a, i think a magic wand is what they used to call them it's something my wife had in the kitchen and it works great but you take about a quarter cup of yeast just regular yeast like you'd cook with mix it in some water and just fill it up a little less than halfway when you're doing this or else it'll splash around and make a mess but you kind of grind that into a, a nice fine slurry form and they're filter feeders so I've been, after I've ground it up, I'll fill up the cup a little bit more and keep it in the refrigerator. But when I'm ready to feed, I'll just mix that up good because it will settle down to the bottom. And the reason I want to grind it up is if you just put just yeast out of the package in there, it'll, it'll float and then it'll just sink to the bottom. It doesn't really mix with the, the water too well. But then I'll just pour some, oops, <laughs> I kind of missed. Just pour a little in there and mix it around. You can see how that makes the water cloudy. And that's what they eat. They're just gonna filter that yeast in and within, oh, by the, by the morning, you know, six, eight hours to 12 hours probably, this water will be perfectly clear and you can feed them again. Now the worst thing you can do is to overfeed them. That, that happened once. I went on a trip and my wife fed them for me and she poured way too much in there. And I came back and I almost lost them all. I only had a few left in there. I was like, oh no. I, so I did a big water change and then got them going again. And it only took like a week and they were back to big numbers. So that was really cool. But yeah, you got to feed them, but don't overfeed them. So the food will spoil in there and, and you know, ruin the cycle. So, uh, yeah, I've, there's other things you can feed them uh, besides this. I know a lot of scientists that work with these, they'll feed them alfalfa and spirulina and uh, ground up trout chow. That's a big one. So I think there's lots of things you can feed them. But besides the yeast, which seems to do well, I will give them green water out of the pond. And what I mean by green water 
is that so if you if you look at the pond out there if you look straight down in the water it looks perfectly clear the water is just amazingly clear but if you take that same water and put it in a white bucket you can see how it's kind of green now it's the middle of winter right now but in the summer that water will even be greener because that the greenness in there is algae basically it's it's phytoplankton and, and algae that's what makes it green and that's a real natural food that these guys really like so about once a week I'll take five gallons, siphon five gallons out of here, take a five gallon bucket, bring some water in from the pond, and that's a real treat for them. Does a little water change on the tank, and everybody's happy and, and good to go. And otherwise, I'll feed them the yeast about, well, at least once a day, but twice a day is best, I think. A little bit twice a day is, is the way to go. Now, the cup here, I'm, I'm using this cup for a reason. It's metal and I can do the, the grinding in it. And it also, I love this lid because it's got a hole in it. You know, with yeast, it's still alive. And if you, it's going to do what yeast does and produce carbon dioxide, right? It's, it's gonna, you, your, your lid, if you get too much pressure on there, it'll explode or it's gonna be really hard to get the lid off of whatever container you're using. And if you do, you know, you do pry off of there, it kind of explodes all over you and it just makes a big mess. So having this little hole in the lid right here, you know, an air vent basically, that's important. But keep it in the fridge and, uh, you know, a, a cup like this, this is about, you know, if I fill this cup up, it's about a week's worth of food for these guys. So I hope this was helpful. If you like this video, please like it and uh, subscribe to the channel and we'll be doing some more stuff soon.